Welcome everybody. My name is Claire Membiella. I'm the Library Law Consultant for the Library of Michigan and I am here today to talk to you about library boards in Michigan and their duties and authority. So we're going to kind of just go have kind of a basic uh, explanation of this. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. I'll answer as many as I can, um, but I will definitely answer all of them after the um, presentation. So that means when you get your email this afternoon, that email will also contain the answers to any questions that have been put in the chat. Okay. So this is my disclaimer. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the library law consultant. I have a master's in library science and a JD um, because I deal with matters relating to law and I am not a practicing attorney. Um, I need to make sure that everybody understands that I cannot give you legal advice and I'm providing information. So you can think of me kind of as your law librarian. If you have any specific questions that impact your library um, that relate to the law, or that you know you need to make a decision on then I would suggest that you contact your library attorney. Um, if you don't have a library attorney I do have a list I maintain a list of attorneys in the state that do library law most of them are municipal attorneys that also do library law I'm happy to share it they're from different areas of the state I try to add to it as I get to know newer attorneys so please don't hesitate to ask me for that list. Okay, so let's start by saying, you know, um, did you know that there are 10 different public library types in Michigan? So as a library board member, or if you're contemplating being a board member, um, it can help to know how libraries in Michigan are generally arranged. So Michigan has 10 different kinds of public libraries. Um, and they are, there's district libraries, there's county libraries, there's one type of village library, there are three different city library types. There's a home rule city library type, and there are two types under the um, City Village Township Libraries Act, or PA 164. Uh, one is the Section 1 city, which is a city library that was created by a, um, either an ordinance or a charter amendment and has uh, between five and nine appointed board members. And then there's the type 10A City Library, which is the City Library um, also under PA 164 that was established via a vote and has a millage and six elected um, board members. There's three different township types right now. Uh, one of them is a repealed type, which is PA 260, uh, 269 under the 1955 school code. Um, and that is a township library established by a township uh, by charter or resolution where the township board is the board of the library. There is um, a, uh, home, uh, excuse me, a charter township library type, which is similar to the 269 type, uh, but only within charter townships. And there are certain parameters you must meet in order to establish a library of this type. There are certain population requirements and time requirements, uh, but the end result is that that library is also um, governed by the township Board of Supervisors. And then finally, there is a township type within PA 164, uh, which is uh, created via election, via millage, and with a six member elected board. And then there is a school public type, which is created by election um, or by ballot by a school district. Now, what's interesting about these 10 different public library types is that every one of these types relies on some kind of board, whether it's the municipal board or whether it's a, a public library board. In Michigan, library boards are integral to the operation and the function of public libraries. So all of you board members, um, I have to say thank you. I have great respect for board members. I know it can be a very difficult job, um, but if without you, libraries in Michigan simply would not be able to exist. So when you're contemplating being on a public library board, you may think to yourself, well, gee, what did I get myself into? Well, public library boards, there are some things that are good to know about public library boards. One, they are legislatively established. That means that the way your board is set up the number of members you have, um, your terms, 
are largely as created or determined by your establishment act by the legislation that enabled the municipality to establish that library and that's kind of important because your powers also emanate from the legislature and we're going to talk about that in a minute because that kind of gets into authority but that's actually a very important fact is that your powers come from the legislature not from your municipality but from the legislature. Because you're a government body, you are governmentally regulated. So there are certain requirements you have. So there's requirements for things like state aid, but there's requirements for things like privacy, for um, transparency and open meetings, for ethics, for fiduciary duty. So there are certain things that because you're a government body, you have a requirement to do that maybe perhaps your local business is not required to do. Your members are publicly elected or appointed. So those are the two ways that public library board members get to be on boards. Um, either you're elected or appointed. Now, whether you're elected or appointed generally emanates from your establishment act. However, there are some library establishment types where the municipalities who are forming the library can choose whether they want their boards to be appointed or elected. And like any choice, there are pros and cons to each of these. From generally speaking, and again, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, and this is a general statement, appointed boards tend to imply or can often mean a little more municipal interaction with the library where um, elected boards can be a little more autonomous. Now again, that's not absolute. For example, with district libraries, um, that's often not the case, but you know, you can, it often can be, okay. So I always say that with um, library directors, or I'm sorry, library board members, no good deed goes unpunished. So here you are, um, a member of the community, and you offer to be on the library board. Um, library boards are, it's often an unpaid position. There are some library establishment types which permit compensation, but that compensation is very minimal. Um, so you don't get paid. Um, it, depending on the library and depending on circumstances that are happening within the library, um, the job can be very easy and efficient and, or it can be very lengthy and very labor intensive. So again, this kind of points to, you know, we very much appreciate boards at the Library of Michigan and without you things would be very different. However, you know, like I said, there's some good and bad things about boards. Boards can be you know, prestigious, you can be on library boards and, and you know, some people it can be um, a very kind of good position in your community, especially you have a big library. People tend to like the library. Um, what's interesting about library boards is that the library board members are often not experienced in the culture or the industry that they are now managing. So a board is in charge of the library, but most library board members beyond their own in personal experiences with the library don't have any really idea of how a library works from the inside, have any idea about the library industry. And that's kind of an interesting fact. Um, but, you know, it can have its advantages, right? So it does bring an outsider's point of view. It does bring people with differing experiences and talents to the library that can assist in other ways. We're going to kind of get back to this in a little bit, but that's something that I think is important to understand. Um, library boards often have to answer to a diverse and very finicky constituent base, right? So your constituent is not only the library director and the staff, but it's also the general public and it's your municipality. So you have a lot of audiences that you have to appeal to. And in some cases, audiences that you have to satisfy. And sometimes that can be very difficult to satisfy everybody in the way that they want to be satisfied. Um, you have to continuously balance the needs of the library against the needs of the staff, the director, um, the, the patrons, and the municipality. You have to supervise and hire a director, and then you have to pretty much keep your hands off the day-to-day -day activities, and that can be very challenging, 
right? Especially if you are um, someone who is used to managing a business or who is used to managing people, it can be very difficult to step into a role where you're charged with the overall oversight and operation, but you don't want to get too much into the weeds because again, you're hiring a director who is a professional who understands the industry and who understands how libraries work. And their job is to make sure the library works on a day to day basis and that it's offering the appropriate services and that the community is getting what they need and that the staff is working the way it's supposed to be working and that the staff also feels, you know, fulfilled and, and um, happy as employees. Um, that's not necessarily always the specific board's job. So again, this can be challenging. Um, it's often time consuming. Um, and what's very important is that a bad experience from a board, whether it is um, a board that has issues or whether it's an individual board member who is not having a good experience or whether it is a board conflict with the director can have very long standing effects with not only the people involved, but with the community, particularly in smaller communities that very strongly depend on their library as a centerpiece of the community. Um, it can make for some very um, awkward situations um, and problems. So that's something else to consider, you know, when you're when you're acting and when you're making decisions that, you know, you, you want to have a big picture long view of what, you know, ramifications are to certain decisions that you may have. Okay, so there are two types of library boards. There's advisory boards and governing boards. Which one of these you sit on, again, is determined by your Library Establishment Act. Advisory boards generally um, work with libraries that are managed by the municipality. So like that uh, Home Rule City Library, Charter Township Library, PA 269 Library. Um, these are libraries that are managed by the municipality. So the boards are the municipal um, agency. Um, so an advisory board, their purpose is generally, um, generally they are appointed by the municipality um, or, you know, the governing board of the library, which would be largely municipality, maybe school board. Um, and their job is to provide advice and guidance. So their job is really to, you know, go to the city, um, the, the city council or the township supervisors and say, okay, um, this is what we recommend as people who have worked closely with the library director, who have, you know, looked at all of the, the um, information on what libraries should be and how things should work. And this is what we recommend. So it can save the, the municipal uh, governing board some time and it can allow um, the library to maybe get more of a voice with the municipal board. Now a governing board is also appointed by the municipality or may be elected. Again, that depends on your establishment type. The governing board is legally responsible for the library. So the governing board is the legal face of the library. So for example, if your library gets sued, it's generally the board that's gonna end up on the lawsuit. Um, not necessarily personally, but as the face of the library. So the board is the legal face of the library. They're kind of the buck stops there. As far as the, the law is concerned, it's the board that retains the responsibility for the library. Um, the board is a fiduciary for the library. And we're going to get back into that in just a minute when we talk about duties. And the library and the board is a decision maker and the driver of library policies and vision. So ultimately, the library board is where all of the power comes from. Um, the, their powers come from the legislature, but once with that power, now they can delegate power to the director because directors don't have any legislatively granted powers. So a director's powers emanates from the board, right? So whatever the powers directors have are the powers that their boards um, give them. And, and, you know, there are best practices. There are models that have been shown to work well and models that have been shown to not work so well. But at the end of the day, it is the board 
that grants those powers to the director. So ultimately the decisions made for the library are squarely in the lap of the board from a responsibility standpoint. And it is the board that is charged with the vision of the library. So the strategic vision uh, and the future vision. And it is the board that is the approver of policies because again, the board is the entity that is left holding the bag if there is a legal problem. So of course they are the ones that are going to want to approve the policies. So when we talk about authority, again with advisory boards, we're talking about authority that's delegated by the state legislature but also by the municipality because the municipality um, is the one that um, appoints the board. And the advisory board, so very rarely is our advisory boards given any legislative power. Um, if you look at the statutes where they actually mention advisory boards, it's pretty much in the context where the municipality uh, is directed to appoint an advisory board. Um, and then it may be a vague thing like to advise them on, you know, uh, library matters or something like that. So the, their exact day-to-day -day ability and their day-to-day -day charge is from the municipality. Most often when you have an advisory board, they are charged with oversight and a consultation type of role. So it would be a board that maybe um, if the uh, municipal board is considering a big decision, um, maybe let's say hiring a new director, they may delegate parts of that to the advisory board um, and then consult them on the final decision. Um, if, you know, and other kinds of large um, decisions like that. Um, the advisory board can act as a check and a balance. So if the advisory board sees something happening that doesn't look kosher or sees a problem, then the advisory board can raise the flag either to the municipality or to other authorities. And then it is also the advisory board's job to support the library, to work with the friends group, um, to work with staff, to do, you know, to advocate with um, the legislative, the legislature and other elected officials on behalf of the library, and to do those kinds of things um, that help support and, and keep the library running. A governing board now, um, as we mentioned, their powers are delegated by the state legislature and sometimes the municipality, but that's actually pretty rare. Um, the, the one case where that really happens is a city library under PA 164, um, section one. So a city library that was created via um, an ordinance or a resolution. Um, and has a five to nine member board appointed um, that has closer ties to their municipality than the other libraries under PA 164. And part of that deal, because they're established by a um, resolution or a charter provision, that charter provision can sometimes um, delegate certain powers or amend or kind of modify certain powers. Um, which the uh, other PA 164 libraries are not, um, are not really uh, subject to. Um, and the same thing possibly with a county library that's run by um, a county library board. Um, the county can have some input on certain powers. So the governing board, as I mentioned, is the legal representative for the library. Their role is a supervisory governance role so they have more of a legal role and more of a direct supervisory role than an advisory board does. They also are there for a check and balance, a check and balance for the director, a check and balance for the staff, and a check and balance for the municipality. Governing boards for public libraries in Michigan are largely autonomous. Now this is something that can be heavily contested by municipalities, but it's important that as a board member that you understand that in most cases, again, unless your governing board is the municipality um, or unless you're a city section one library under PA 164 or a county library where your uh, establishment documents and the charters and things that formed you um, add some um, caveat or limitation, you are largely autonomous and there is case law to support this. And then your job also is a huge role of support for the library, right? So, so 
since most of your function deals with finances, your job is to support the library by making sure it's financially secure, um, by making sure the employees have everything they need to do a good job, um, by making sure the community understands the importance of the library and what they do, and by making sure that your elected uh, representatives at the state and federal level also understand libraries and um, understand what they need to do to support it. Now, when we talk about authority and municipalities, um, it helps to know a little bit about the history of public libraries in Michigan. Now, Michigan is one of the first states in the nation to have public libraries. Um, and it's one of the first that had a real organized kind of system of statewide public libraries. Um, that origin was very strongly rooted in townships and in school districts. So if you look back in the history of a lot of libraries in Michigan, you find that many of them were started by like ladies um, book clubs or ladies uh, social clubs that then got kind of large and put their books in a school. Um, or they were libraries that were formed in the school and then opened to the public. So schools had a very strong historical presence in libraries in Michigan. And in our constitution, you notice that it mentions townships, putting libraries in every township. So between the townships and the school districts, um, libraries in Michigan have always been a very local entity right, very, very tied to the communities in which they exist. Now, because of this, so we ended up with kind of this weird, almost double set of laws. So you have the set of laws that deal with libraries at the local level. So things like um, PA 269, that was part of the school code that enabled um, township libraries, townships to create libraries um, pretty much as departments of townships. But then it also had provisions that allowed schools to create public libraries. When, um, so those were very, again, very traditional libraries where it was pretty much a local community saying, we just want to start a library. But then you had PA 164 come out in 1877 and PA 164 was kind of this new model of library that was starting up in like New York and some other states and like I said Michigan was one of the early ones to adopt this and PA 164 was more of a quote-unquote modern idea where it created libraries that were a little bit more um, uniform and a little bit more standardized and that kind of spoke more to like a statewide library system and it, you know that kind of created this kind of dichotomy where you kind of had these two systems almost existing at the same time one very tied to the municipality and one that is actually written to be very autonomous from a municipality so if you're a municipality that went under PA 164 and created a library, it's very easy to understand that some municipalities then just treated the PA 164 library as they would their own library because to them it was their own library. So you do see instances, even though under the law, a PA 164 library and a district library um, are extremely autonomous, the you may find a situation where to the municipality they're not and because of the history involved in that community and that library um, they're kind of just doing things the way they've always done them and the municipality may have a little bit more hand in it than perhaps they would if it was created today as a two six as a 164 library um, so I, I give you that information as a way to kind of just open this conversation of um, authority and what ideally under the law, your authority is as a board member and as, as a public library. Um, so in Michigan right now, even though we have a lot of PA 164 libraries, if you look at those libraries individually, you will see a varying levels of autonomy and varying levels of municipal relationships. And a lot of times it's really not a problem until it becomes a problem, right? Until you get a new city manager or until something changes um, that kind of throws things off kilter. Um, so it's important to understand that um, as, as um, a public library in Michigan, as I said, you're largely autonomous 
and your powers, since your powers are delegated by the legislature and not by your municipality, this is part of um, the reasoning why um, you are largely autonomous. And if you look at some of the case law on this, um, that's one of the factors that they look at. Um, you're not a department of your, your municipality, right? Even though your municipality may think of you that way, um, you're not, right? You, you are a separate entity. Um, now, you, you have to balance that with good municipal relationships, right? Because if you don't have good municipal relationships, that can cause a lot of problems. But it's important to understand your authority, even if, let's say, let's say, for example, that right now you don't have um, the, the library, the municipality does not consider the library to have the autonomy that the library should have, right? So maybe you have a treasurer that spends a little too much time uh, in, in, you know, questioning things. Um, so as a board, you balance that against what would be the problems if we pushed back against this, right? Do we just let this go because it really hasn't caused any problem or do we push back against that? So I think that is why a lot of these libraries have this varying, um, uh, these varying relationships and these varying kind of levels of autonomy uh, because like I said when you're in a community and day to day and you have to look at the same treasurer every week or every month when you're paying your bills um, you want to be on good terms with them but my job is is also to let you know ultimately what the law says so it's important that you know that the default is to be largely autonomous. Now, because there are so many different establishment types in Michigan, um, and because there, are, there can be variables in terms of if you have a charter section, or it is important that if you have an issue and you believe that your municipality is infringing on the library's um, autonomy, that you contact your attorney. And I'm gonna talk about some specific examples of that right now. Um, for most library establishment types in Michigan, municipalities cannot dictate policy or personnel issues. Now that's tempered by the fact that if you have a contract with your municipality that say makes your employees, municipal employees for purposes of benefits and stuff, then that contract is gonna rule over the fact that you know you are largely autonomous because the board can contract away certain uh, duties and certain rights. There are certain ones they can't contract away, but there are certain ones that they can. So if you have that kind of contract, then obviously that may interfere with your ability to um, say supervise your employees or in in uh, impose certain policies on them. It all depends on what that contract says. Municipalities cannot arbitrarily assign overhead charges. Now, this is something that is coming up right now. Um, we've had a few different questions on this from different libraries. And what's important to understand here is, so right now, municipalities are looking for money, right? Everybody is strapped for money. And partly what they're doing is they're looking at their overhead um, and they're looking for ways to bill other municipal entities for services that say that um, the treasurer may provide or rent or um, I had one where they were trying to charge them depreciation. So if you have a municipality that is trying to give you a giant bill, it's very important that you talk to your attorney because in very rare instances, is that something that's gonna be largely appropriate? There are several legal arguments for why a municipality should not be billing a public library, say for things like um, the treasurer giving you your millage or the treasurer um, uh, you know, putting your millage on the ballot or um, they, you know, they shouldn't be billing you for, for services that the municipality is supposed to provide anyway. Can they bill you for rent? Yes. If you are using um, a municipal building, even if you've used it for generations and never been billed for it, um, if the municipality owns the building, then unless there's a document or a contract or something that says that the library will not be billed, the library can be billed rent. Now, can you negotiate that? Sure. So there are some things that they can bill you for, but there are things that they can't. So again, if you get hit with a large bill out of the blue, um, it's important to contact your attorney because that it, most cases that's not going to be okay. Um, municipalities um, are often, their role is the checks and balances, right? So if you look at, for example, again, PA 164, 
very often it's you know it says that the library board is uh, has exclusive control of the money but the the municipality very often holds the money right so the money is put in a municipal in a municipal fund so it's put in the treasury of the municipality and the treasurer is the entity that writes the checks but it's the library board that determines how that money is spent and in some instances there are um, municipalities that feel that those lines are blurred and that they have a responsibility to make sure that the library spends the money correctly now, now that may be partly true because part of the municipality's role is to be like a check and balance. So if, you know, a treasurer witnesses a um, library that's, you know, spending money on vacations or, you know, something wildly, should they speak up? Yes. But it is not up to a municipality to nitpick and look over a library's expenditures and ask, you know, why are you spending this much with this publisher this month when last month you spent a different amount? Why are you spending money on, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots? You know, that's not up to a municipality to, to poke at. The municipality's job is basically oversight and to be the bank. And not even, I say oversight, but that's kind of a, a, a sticky word. Really just a check and balance. Um, and and to provide the accounting, the the you know the the disbursement of the funds. So they're really you can look at them as the bank. That's that's the municipality's purpose. Um, and then if you're a district library, that's even taken out of the equation. Um, municipalities can be partners in certain policies so sometimes it may behoove the library to work with your municipality for example if your municipality has a really good ada policy um, and an ada coordinator or your municipality has a foia coordinator and a good foia policy then depending on the size of your library and the size of your staff that may be an area that maybe you want to work with your municipality right because those rules can be very similar for the library and for the municipality and if your municipality is already doing Doing it then that may be something that may be helpful but again those decisions are decisions that would be made by the board as to whether they wanted to do it or not so to some you are largely autonomous um, the municipality is meant to be a checks and balance not meant to be a supervisor um, best case scenario you work with your municipality and you both kind of work in a way that works best for both of you uh, but at the end of the day um, the library is responsible for itself in most library uh, establishment incidents. So powers. Powers are going to be in your Establishment Act. Now, in the library establishment types that where the municipality is their board, so for example, the Home Rule City Library, the, um, the uh, uh, Charter Township Library, and the um, some, in some ways, the city section one, um, those, those in some ways their powers um, are not going to be listed in the statute, although I'm sorry, city section one is listed. Um, there, and, and the statute pretty much says that the municipality is the boss, right? But in every other library establishment type, so whether you are a county library or city library, district library, your powers are laid out as a board within the statute, which is one of the reasons why if you have not read your Establishment Act, um, it is vitally important that you do that. And if you are a district library, not only should you read the District Library Establishment Act, but you should also make sure that you've read your district library um, agreement. Um, every district library is required by law to have a district library agreement with a few exceptions. If you're a district library that was created prior to 1989, uh, you may only have um, an organizational plan and not an agreement. But if you have a district library agreement, it is very important that you read it. And, and I have met many, many boards and many, many directors who have not read their Establishment Act. The reason why this is important is because your Establishment Act is what makes you a legal entity. So it's your Establishment Act that makes the library a library and makes your library have the ability to have money, to hire people, to um, own property, to um, you know, uh, invest, to uh, have endowments. It is 
It is the fact that you are legally established is what makes that possible. And legally established is under your Establishment Act. So your Establishment Act is pretty much your whole being. So it's very important that as a board member, since this is your charge, that you understand not only what your powers are, but the limits of your power, as well as what the authority between your municipality and the library is. So I put an example on the slide here, which is from PA 164. PA 164 has very broad powers for the board. Um, and the fact that this was from 1877 uh, is pretty, I find pretty interesting because the powers here are really, really, um, like if we were to write it today, I don't think that we would change too many of these powers. Um, this pretty much hands the responsibility of the library and the authority of the library square in the hands of the board, which is a very good thing, um, rather than the municipality. And the key part of that is the money, that the money, the library board is the exclusive, exclusively controls the money. Um, and that's, again, a very valuable thing. So I strongly encourage you to take to read through this. Um, so duty, let's talk about your duties now. We talked about authority, we talked about powers. So duty, there are two main duties right now. Now, if you were a corporate board, there would be some extra ones, but as a municipal board and as a um, library board, you have a fiduciary duty and you have ethical duty. So your fiduciary duty, now under the law, Okay, if you were to Google fiduciary duty and definition, and you were to look for a legal definition of fiduciary duty, fiduciary duty pretty much means that anything the board does, any decision they make, any money they spend, their whole purpose, everything they do must be in the best interests of the library. So to the exclusion of all else. So that means that, you know, personal um, politics, personal preferences, personal likes and dislikes need to be put aside and the decisions that are made have to be made objectively in the best interests of the library. Um, and it can be very difficult to separate that out, especially when you're dealing with a community that's very tied to its library. Um, and there are some libraries in the state where they were formed in some instances like, you know, by a family. And in those, you know, it can be very hard to separate from the library. But this fiduciary duty is paramount. It is a very strong legal concept and the consequences for violating it can be severe. So it's very important that boards and board members understand that your very first duty is this fiduciary duty, particularly where it comes to spending money and the management of the money. Then your ethical duty, a lot of this comes out of the fact that you are a public official, right? So you have accountability, transparency, um, conflict of interest, um, we're going to delve into this a little bit more in a minute, but you know these are the, the primary kind of prongs of the, your ethical duty. And as a board member, you should have um, sworn an oath of office when, when you were, um, you know, uh, kind of finally appointed or finally your election was approved and you were ready to start. Um, you should have been sworn in by your municipality because every public official is required to say an oath of office. And that oath holds you to these duties. Now, when we talk about ethics, as I mentioned, we're talking about conflict of interest, transparency, and accountability. So with conflict of interest, um, again, there are statutes that govern this, but what this pretty much speaks to is avoiding your commingling your board duty and your personal business, right? This is pretty obvious. Uh, if you own a cleaning company and the library needs a cleaner, um, you would, you know, recuse yourself from that conversation. Does not necessarily mean the library can't hire that, but that you can't be involved in that decision. Um, and you need to disclose uh, any possible uh, uh, 
involvement you may have, particularly what they call pecuniary or you know money involvement that you may have in a decision. Now, there's also, you know, there may be a familial conflict of interest, right? Um, we strongly um, try to dissuade uh, people from having family members um, be on the board. So for example, uh, if you work at a library, your family member should not be a board member. If you're a board member, your family member should not be working at the library. And again, that's because as the board, you are the boss of the library. So that puts you in an awkward position if you have to say um, furlough staff or you have to uh, lower wages or you have to deny a raise. You know, if you have someone working there, then that can create all kinds of sticky situations where maybe there isn't even any intent of, of you know, wrongdoing or any intent of conflict, but it's going to be there and people are going to assume. So it's not a good idea uh, to have, you know, family members be on boards. And there is a law called um, the Incompatible Offices Act. Uh, which sometimes um, is invoked here, and then there's also conflict of interest uh, statutes. Um, then there could also be political conflict of interests, right? So again, this happens more often with a um, appointed board, but there are sometimes instances where maybe a municipality and a library is not getting along, and a municipality appoints a board member, um, maybe uses a board seat as a weapon, or as a tool of revenge to get back at a particular library. Um, the, I, the, we've seen this with instances like uh, libraries that have, um, where boards have decided to opt out of TIFA, you know, the law that permits libraries to off, opt out of uh, contributing to DDAs uh, from um, millages. There are some instances where municipalities aren't happy that libraries have done that. And so they try to retaliate by um, refusing to reappoint uh, popular board members or board members that um, have been doing a good job or longstanding board members. And instead, they appoint uh, board members that are going to do what the city wants and try to reverse that. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, again, that's one of those instances where um, if you are a board member that's appointed, under certain circumstances, it's important to understand that your duty is to the library, not to the municipality that appointed you. Uh, and I've actually had arguments with board members over this. Um, your duty is to the library, right? Your duty is not to the city mayor that appointed you. Um, the purpose of them appointing is that that gives the city uh, a voice on the board, right? So that, that gives um, the, the municipality and the community a voice on the board. It is not meant to be a political tool. So the, the board member's job is to work for the library, right? Not, not just for the library staff, not just for the director, not for themselves, not for the, the person that appointed them, but for the library as a whole. And that's very important to remember. Um, transparency. So you have the Open Meetings Act and you have FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. Um, not gonna go into a whole lot of um, uh, detail on these because they're pretty well represented. There's handbooks for both of them at the Attorney General's um, website. Um, what's important is that board members understand what these acts do and the ramifications of not following them, particularly the Open Meetings Act. The importance of the Open Meetings Act is that no decision, no decision that affects library, significantly affects library operations or policy can be made outside of a public meeting. This means that the direct, the, the board president and two, two friends on the board can't make a decision on how things are going to work um, and then, you know, try to just figurehead it through the board. No, the entire board has to vote on a decision. Now, there are certain circumstances where, you know, this may be uh, exempted like emergencies, but those are rare. Um, the whole purpose behind these laws is transparency, the idea that members of the public have a right to see how their government works and to see how decisions are made and to have a role 
in those decisions. So if you remember that, then that can help you make judgment calls when you're trying to figure out whether or not um, you need to, you know, have a public meeting. Um, you need to understand document retention and availability and the Privacy Act, what information you can disclose and what you cannot disclose. One important thing to remember is that as a government entity, there is very little information that is completely private. In a public library, it pretty much is anything dealing with patrons is largely private, but anything dealing with staff is largely public. So this means that staff salaries and names attached to salaries are public record. So, you know, there are lots of conflicts that come when um, in a board meeting they discuss salaries or raises. It is okay to do that. Um, and board members need to see salaries and names and they need to see um, job descriptions. Um, there, you know, pretty much a board member should have access to any information that board member needs to complete their duties. Does that mean that a board member should be poking around in personnel files just because they feel like it? Absolutely not. But if a board member is, say, for example, um, they're considering a reorganization, and you would hope the director would be involved in this because they would be the best person to advise the board. Should the board have access to job descriptions? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if the board is trying to work on benefits, should the board have access to staff information that can help them figure out a better benefits package or health insurance package? Absolutely. So the board really has to be thought of as the employer and information that is given to the employer should be accessible to the board. And again, the board has a duty to treat that information um, confidentially where it is warranted and to treat that information with respect. Accountability. So you have checks and balances. So you have audits. Um, you have bylaws. And that means your bylaws should be kept current. Um, and then you should be a check and balance for each other as a board, right? So if you see something, say something. Um, oversight over your bylaws. If you have a member that is, and even if that's the board president who is violating bylaws, call them on it. And I know that's easier said than done, but one important thing to remember is in most situations, you you're in the majority, right? Even if you have, if you're a seven or a six member board and you have three members that are maybe causing trouble, there are still three of you that can you know, confront them. If you're a seven member board, you have four of you. So you have power, right? What it requires is um, a commitment to stand up. And yes, that can be uncomfortable, but it's important that that happens. Um, you have statutes that are, you have to follow, including um, terms. Now, I know in a lot of um, communities, it can be difficult to find board members and it can be difficult to replace board members. But is in, it is important that board members acknowledge terms. So you can't just roll into a new term without getting reappointed or without getting on the ballot. I have seen some boards that have done intricate, complicated things and figured out loopholes to avoid getting having to get reelected. <clears throat> and to me, that's just kind of weird. <laughs> you might as well just get reelected, just, you know, get on the ballot, right? So it's very important because <clears throat> with the community, it's important that the community has confidence and respect in the public officials and confidence and respect in the board. Because if you're running on a millage and you're going to knock on doors to get a millage from your community, you want to make sure that your community trusts you and that you know, you have that ability to be trusted because all it would take, you know, again, remember, this is all public record. Your meeting minutes are public record. Your meetings are public record. Meetings can be recorded by anybody who wants to record them. Um, documents can be FOIA'd. Very few documents are not um, uh, subject to FOIA. And all it will take is, is a member of the community who's not happy finding the one mistake you made and they can cause a lot of trouble for you. So it's, again, 
transparency. It's always better to err on the side of transparency. And it's always better to, you know, if, if by the time you end up in a very big board problem, um, it, it's almost, it, it gets exponentially more difficult to solve it. If at the beginning, you know, you're willing to see a problem, whether it's a person who is creating difficulties, it's, it's, it's better in the long run to stand up sooner rather than later. You know, if you see attrition and you see staff leaving, you, you have a director that is trying to get your attention that there are problems, it's better to address those problems sooner rather than later, even if it means an uncomfortable conversation. And there are people who can help you with that. So as far as uh, these matters with ethics and so far concerned, the object is to treat your coworkers and colleagues with respect, fairness, and good faith. Right, and advocate conditions of employment that safeguard the rights and welfare of all employees. So what I tell boards is, you know, treat the employees like you'd want to be treated at a job, right? Sometimes it can be hard to remember what it was like. Um, I'm 56, okay? And so I've been doing this for 30 years and I started out, you know, as a page at the library. And sometimes it can be hard to remember what it was like when I was shelving books and I was, but it's important to remember, you know, to consider that you're managing a group of people. And in some, in a lot of cases, you're managing a group of people that this is their livelihood and this is their profession. And it's important to acknowledge that. And it's important to, um, you know, uh, treat them like you would want to be treated at work. Um, it also means be prepared if you need to, to whistle blow get involved, ask questions if you think that something doesn't look right, whether you're a director or a member of the board, and stand up if something doesn't look right. There's a lot of people to support you if you do. So board responsibilities involve big pictures, right? So your strategic plan, the library's vision, the ultimate library goals, you know, whether, you know, do you want to expand into a new building? Are you looking, are you a township library? Maybe you're looking that you want to become a district. These big picture things are squarely the purview of the direct of the board, but that doesn't mean the director shouldn't be involved. Um, maintain the library's fiscal health which is, you know, right now where we have this kind of impending downturn, this is going to be a very, very important um, responsibility of boards. Um, money, uh, where is it going to come from? Um, if you have millages coming up, how are you going to make sure that those millages get, you know, get passed? What are you going to do if it doesn't get passed? Um, you know, how, how working with your friends group, right? Um, keeping the budget um, in a, in a, particular place where where you know not only can the library function but you have enough money to pay for everything and again that means making sometimes some hard decisions um, knowing your library you know again knowing the establishment of your library reading the laws so that you understand what your authority and powers are knowing the history of your library how have things been done in the past how, where did your library come from um, and, and then reading all the documents that are available on your library's history and its establishment. Um, reading the job description of your director, if they were there before you were. Um, hiring and supporting and coaching a director, right? So it's not just hiring a director, but it's also supporting that director. Director and a board should not be adversaries, right? And unfortunately, that happens all too often. A board and a director should be partners because if that relationship doesn't work, the library doesn't work, right? That's an absolute. If the, if the relationship between the board and the director falls apart, then the library starts to fall apart. Um, and it can get ugly very quick. It's very important for mutual respect and mutual, to commu mutual communication to occur. I don't think that you can have too much communication between the director and the board and between the board and the director. Um, and partly that's trust, right? Because if you don't trust somebody, you're not going to want to talk to them. Um, advocate, advocacy, right? Make sure that everybody in your community knows about the library. Chances are, as board members, you have a certain, you've attained a certain level in your community, um, a business owner 
or you know um, someone who's lived there a very long time and knows a lot of people talk to people in the community do you use the library if you don't why you should use the library um, you know uh, when was the last time that you you know went to a, a program at the library um, you know here's what it costs to run the library and here's what you pay in millage you see all of the you know all of the the value you get especially right now right so you know libraries who have worked through the pandemic are still providing services um, and helping schools and helping learning those are all valuable things that can be brought out to a community uh, especially one that's working on a millage um, understand how the library profession works and i think this is so important um, every new orientation for board members should include something along the lines of a day in the life of the library director or a day in the life of a library staff member bring the bring the board member behind the scenes this is what cataloging looks like this is what um, processing looks like this is what reference looks like this is what circulation looks like this is the problems that we have at circulation this is the challenges that we overcome because it's hard for a board member to really understand because they're not involved in most of the time they're not involved in this industry and so opening that door to them and giving them like um, a retreat where it's a day in the life where you know you sit them at the circ desk with with a staff member and and have them you know see what happens because you know that's one of the ways that they can learn and they can you know in essence feel your pain and see you know challenges that that you may um, be dealing with whether it's space whether it's staffing whether it's you know policies that are not um, uh, uh, taken well by the community those are all things that if you expose your board to it a little bit then that helps them learn right it helps them learn about about libraries and how they work and that can help them make better decisions um, connect and then as a board member it's your job to help connect the community to the library as I mentioned through different relationships and help make sure the library has what it needs to satisfy the community if you know listen to your director if your director indicates that you know there there's a, a, a project or a plan you know employ active listening really try to understand you know what it is that you know they're looking for and what they're trying to accomplish even if it doesn't meet with what your personal idea of what a library should do is so I've run into boards where um, the board members are upset because for example the library isn't full of children and they blame the director for not offering programs that encourage children to be in the library but the problem is their community does not have a lot of children, right? There are communities in Michigan that are losing their young people. And so, you know, if you have a community where your demographic skews largely older people, then your program should be for older people, right? Your library has to work with its community and your director understands that. So again, you have to listen to your director and learn about, um, you know your community and what the library can do okay so this is a list of board offices and what they're largely um, should be doing so president the job of a president is to main control of process they're, they're kind of like you know when you have officers on the board this is you know the board president's kind of like the the person who should be keeping everything in control a major um, job of a board officer is to rein members in right so if you have a board member who is not following the rules who is not following bylaws it is up to the board president to approach that officer and talk to them they can do it privately they can but that is one of the main jobs of the board president um, the rest are are pretty um, uh, self-explanatory um, a trustee um, so if you don't have a, a specific office your job is eyes and ears right checks and balances right um, ask questions assist officers and provide honest uh, critique so what are boards not responsible for well you're not responsible for daily operations right um, just like the 
board of a Fortune 500 company is not responsible for the daily operations. Target's board is not responsible for the daily operations at Target stores. Um, their CEO is responsible. That's the same with the board and the library director. So if you're walking to the library and you see something that doesn't look right, don't talk to a library staff member to fix it. That's not really your job. Talk to the library director later. Send them an email. I noticed this and I just wanted to let you know. Do not get between the library staff and the director. That is a major mistake. And it's, and it's an understandable mistake, but it can cause lots of problems. It isn't worth it. Um, collection development. So you can suggest things, but it's not the board's job to decide what the library, what kind of materials the library buys. It's their job to look at the budget um, if it's maybe over a certain amount of money, but if you're talking about titles and you're talking about, you know, maybe the, the, the direction that the collection as a whole should go into, that's really, again, what a librarian is trained to do. Um, implementation of programs and services. Boards should know what kind of programs and services the library offers. Um, again, they can suggest things. But the board shouldn't be showing up at, you know, the, the film and, you know, running things. So the board, the board can certainly attend programs. It would be good for boards to attend and to, to see what's going on and to support. But again, let the director and the staff do their job. If you have a question or you see something that doesn't look right, then like in any other um, employment company situation, address that with the director separately. Friends group. Board is not responsible for the Friends Group. The Friends Group is a separate nonprofit corporation. The money of the Friends Group belongs to the Friends Group. And the best the library should do is have an agreement, a memorandum of understanding with the Friends Group that talks about the money the Friends raise and how that's going to be, uh, how the use of it is going to be determined. Um, the board of the library should not be on the board of the Friends Group. The board of the library could be members of the Friends Group, but they should not be in a decision-making capacity because, again, that's a, a conflict of interest. Um, board procedure, um, you should be operating under a parliamentary procedure, um, whether that's Robert's Rules of Order um, or um, there is another one, um, I believe it's called Sturgis. If um, the Library of Michigan has copies of Robert's Rules of Order that we can mail out if there, you would like a copy. Um, you, remember, you want to have regular open meetings. If your open meetings get contentious or if for some reason um, you think that it would be useful, post rules of engagement, post rules for the meeting. And that can be things like cell phones have to be put away for board members. Um, you have, you know, you have to listen completely to what someone says before you interrupt. Everybody gets a chance to offer information. There are different kind of templates for general meetings for, excuse me, general rules for meetings. And I'm happy to send you um, those too. And those again can be very useful if you're contemplating a contentious meeting. Your bylaws. Bylaws, um, are the board's rules of operation for themselves, right? So it's not the policies of the library, it's the policies of the board. Take a look at yours, because if you want the ability to police each other, you have to put it in the bylaws. If you wanna have attendance provisions, if you wanna have term limits, if you wanna, um, you know, you should have a social media policy, which board members, you know, can you post to social media or is that only something a staff member can do? If you post to social media, what are the rules? Who's the spokesperson for the library if something happens and you have the media that you're going to talk to? Um, is it the director? Is it one member of the board? You should only have one so that if there, God forbid, there is a problem, um, you have one consistent um, message out to the community and not multiple messages. Um, who can talk to the attorney? Can the director call the attorney? Um, only one person should be calling the attorney because every time you call your attorney, they're gonna bill you. So if four different board members call the attorney for the same question, you're gonna get billed four different times. Um, reimbursement. Do you get reimbursed for things you pay with your own money for the board? Um, what is the rules for guidelines with inter interactions with library staff? And 
What about adherence to library policies? Do you have to pay overdue fines if your library has them? Um, do you get, are there any perks that you get? If you do, again, make sure that they're listed so that everybody understands. Again, it's about the limits. Um, it's about authority and limits to authority. Everybody understands the rules and that way if somebody oversteps the rules, then you have a mechanism to pull them back. So you also need a consequence of infraction. That consequence can't, consequence can't be being kicked off the board because that's a legal issue, but there are other things that you can do as a consequence. Um, funding, um, there are, this is the list of all the different ways that libraries are funded. Um, I would recommend that you get a brush up on the TIFA opt-outs if you don't know it, um, and personal property tax. Um, and um, I would probably going to have a separate webinar on this, but I want to include this slide just for those of you who were not familiar with that. Um, we talked about this. Uh, we talked about this. Um, so from this, and I have a little bit, tiny bit over, the one thing that for this that I want to uh, make sure that is, is um, kind of emphasized is that this top one, everyone works with people that they might not socialize with, people with opposite politics, points of view, etc. Your board ideally should mirror the demographics of your community. Now, statistics say from the ALA and some other sources that most library boards in the country uh, are very, not diverse. If your community is diverse, then it's important, as I said, that your board mimic the demographics of your community. So you should work on how can you recruit board members that better illustrate your demographics. Um, people with children, um, minorities, um, maybe younger people. Um, and some of that may mean having your board meetings during times when those entities can attend, weekends, after work. Uh, it might mean maybe offering childcare uh, at a board meeting. Um, and all of these things are doable. Um, right now, of course, they're virtual, so that's even better. But it, sometimes it takes some effort, right? So a library board should not be a club that's only open to a few people. I know it's very tempting that if you have a board that's running very well and somebody leaves, the instinct is to find someone else who fits in that person's slot. Who, who you know, who you can get along with, who will keep everything running smoothly. But that might not be what's necessarily good for the library. Every time you have a new board member, you have to expect some change. Every time you have a new director, you have to expect some change. So change can stink and change is hard, but in the end, that's what's better for your community and for your library. So again, it's very important to kind of look at how you recruit new board members um, and make that as transparent and as open as possible to give everybody an equal opportunity to join the library and have a say. Lastly, you want to make sure that you yourself use the library. Um, get a if you don't, you'd be surprised how many board members I talk to who don't have library cards. Get a library card if you don't have one. Use the library because how can you criticize anything in the library or how can you address anything in the library that you're supposed to manage? if you don't use it. Um, and libraries have changed a lot since you were younger and have used it, even if you're 30, okay? Libraries have changed a lot since you were in school or you were young and probably used a library. So it's important that you use your library and you get to know its services and its challenges in order to be an effective uh, director or um, sorry, an effective board member. This slide provides some support. Luckily, there's a lot of help available. Um, your library cooperative, I have an example here of the library network. There are several library cooperatives. They are also working on some tools and some information and training for board members. So I would definitely get in contact, uh, talk to your director and ask them to get in contact with your uh, library cooperative and find out more about that. The Library of Michigan, we've just submitted an updated library uh, trustee handbook for printing. So that will be coming out. We'll be sending a copy to everybody. We have access to United for Libraries, which is ALA's division aimed specifically at boards and friends groups. This is the username and password for the Michigan subscription. Um, please 
you know, you go to ALA.org slash United and log in. This has a lot of training materials and sample materials of great use to boards. And then there's also FOMO, the Friends of Michigan Libraries, which is a local group, which also supplies a huge amount of information and support for library trustees. So even though this job is difficult, it's you have a lot of support and a lot of people that want you to succeed. So I went a few minutes over. Thank you very much um, for attending. I will be sending these slides out. If you have, I will go through the chat and look at any questions and answer them in the email. And I very much appreciate your attention today. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day.